Okay. There we go. All right, my book, Killing Time in the Catskills, The Twisted Tale of the Catskill Ripper, Elizabeth Lizzie McNally Halliday. Uh, this is about a woman who in 1893 killed her husband and buried him under the floorboards. Is anyone familiar with Lizzie's story? Okay, well, even in 1893, the Catskills was made up of Permanent residents, who's a permanent resident up here, right? Those people who just visited when the weather was nice and you know they didn't have to shovel and tolerate the bad weather. So there were lots of summer visitors. And then there was the uh, snowbirds, people who just came up once in a while. But in that particular summer of 1893, things were about to change drastically in Burlingham, New York. So they now had a new resident and her name was Lizzie Halliday. I wanna thank you all for coming and I wanna thank the uh, staff of the Time and Valleys Museum, Christina, Donna, Steffens, who could not be here today, but I'd like to thank her for uh, chasing, uh, chasing this presentation down. Um, we had tried to set it up prior to the pandemic during the pandemic, and finally, here we are. Um, I hate to even say the word pandemic, but it applies. How did the book get started? Well, that was, uh, that's a question that's normally posed to me after every presentation, so I'll just answer it now. After reading a, a horrible true crime book, I got on the internet and just did a basic search as what true crime has happened in my basic vicinity near my home. I found a number of interesting cases, including another uh, case, a, most likely my next book. But the one that we're here talking about today, I found Lizzie Halliday's case, and it was it was missing a lot of pertinent information. There was there was basically a Wikipedia page with about three paragraphs that explained a, the crimes that she committed, the fact that she was from Ireland, and basically how she was punished for those crimes. There were, it left me with a lot of questions, and I started researching. Um, I called the Sullivan County historian directly John Conway because he was one of the people who had published information about Lizzie and um, seemed to have a, a handle on it. So we talked for quite a while and he agreed with me that the information regarding Lizzie was elusive, if not just impossible to find. So what I could tell you after years of research and years, you know, and, and the time it took to put together the book. What happened all those years ago was it turned out a small, frail looking woman had somehow learned two women to her home in Burlingham, New York, and murdered them in a seemingly motiveless crime. Additionally, her husband, thought to be missing, was found later under the kitchen floorboards. My interest was piqued. I was, this is a true crime I had, I had never heard of, and it happened just miles from my home. I had probably driven past wherever she had lived and didn't even know it. I was, I was quickly looking for more data. What, what happened during that time? There were a lot of things left um, unresolved, basically by the initial research. I became inundated with vast quantities of information that needed to be fact-checked, sorted, and placed in a timeline of Lizzie's lifespan. My goal was to figure out her lifespan, not just the crime she committed, the name of ex-detective or where she spent her time incarcerated, 
So I had created a timeline on my wall of my uh, office and had a birth and a death, and I needed to fill in the rest. This is when my wife got extremely nervous. Uh, I had started to put in post-it notes and attach when a certain character that came up continually uh, was in the story. Now I needed to research that character. A complete biographical timeline of Lizzie's past would be essential in determining the motives in her murders, if there were any. If she was insane, as seemed to be the criminal defense, and if that defense was even plausible, was she really insane? That was the question I had with Sullivan County historian John Conway, and he had the same question. Was she insane? Was she just a very clever manipulator? What I found that Lizzie had a startling lifestyle of indefensible crimes perpetrated by the same woman who stood trial in Sullivan County, New York in the late 1800s for the three brutal homicides and suspected of many more. As you can see from, this is a postcard of Burlingham in 1893. Burlingham, as most of the Catskills in 1893, was a quaint slice of rural Americana. People love to come up here for the summers, right? Why not? Nestled in the lower Catskill region, it had become a favorite getaway for those looking to retreat uh, to the countryside over the summer months. Most farmhouses in the area cater to the summer boarders and took in, you know, people for room and meals. Uh, the following is, is directly from a document at the Mamacating Historical Society. In 1893, the town of Burlingham had a church, school, town hall, general store, post office, a sawmill, and a grist mill. It also had several livery stables and a blacksmith, as well as a wagon shop. The late summer of 1893 was quickly to become very different for those visiting, as well as those who lived in Burlingham. The last week of August through the first week of September was to be known as a week of accumulated horrors, as dubbed by the Republican Watchman, which was a Monticello newspaper. Neighbors had reported to uh, Paul Halliday's son, and that's Lizzie's husband, Paul Halliday. They, they had reported to Paul Jr. that his father had not been seen around his own property. It's very unusual for him. He was outdoors all the time as he processed wood. Oh, great. Very good. Thank charcoal you. Charcoal for local industry. Okay. Paul Jr. visits the farm and is greeted by his stepmother, Lizzie. She explains that his father is not home and shows him a nice ring, explaining that it was a gift from Paul Sr. While leaving the property, Paul Jr. notices that the house is being watched by local law enforcement. After a time and much discussion, they get a search warrant, but Lizzie won't cooperate. They devise a plan after refuse, uh, Lizzie refuses them entry to the house. Lizzie has stated that Paul went to adjoining an adjoining town, Bloomingburg, New York, to buy property. His family felt this was odd because he had not mentioned this to anyone. So they convinced Lizzie to es uh, be escort a constable to Bloomingburg, where she was to point out where this property was, where Paul Sr. went. And it was really just a ruse to get her away from the house. And I'm gonna read just um, 
a brief part of the book here. The group searching the house included Justice Thayer. They found a bucket in which Lizzie had been scrubbing a rag rug with a stiff brush. The stain on the rug looked suspiciously like blood. Inside the bucket, they also found a piece of rope that seemed to be stained with blood as well. Looking around the house, they also found an ax handle which seemed bloody on the end, a crowbar, a bloodied board, and two shovels. There was also an extremely large amount of dirt and hay on the floor indoors, which when pushed aside seemed to be covering blood-stained floorboards. They began to look frantically for Paul Sr. as the group was certain he had met with foul play. In the bedroom, the bed was covered in clothing, but when this was pushed aside, they found blood-stained sheets as well that had been washed recently. A hole had been cut in the sheets and was thought to be done to hide evidence. What they didn't find was Paul Sr. anywhere. Seeing the shovel, they were concerned he had been buried outdoors in the surrounding mountains or countryside, making finding his remains near impossible. Having searched the small house thoroughly, they all went outside to look around. One of the men ventured into the small crawl space under the barn and saw something odd buried under hay and manure. Under closer examination, he saw that it was indeed a human arm protruding from the waste pile. He called out to the others searching and soon the area under the barn was full of the crew searching for Paul Halliday. To their surprise, they did not find Paul Sr. in the composting hay. What they found was not one, but two bodies. <clears throat> Lizzie is quickly brought back to her home via telegram sent to Bloomingburg. <clears throat> okay, that's their, uh, that's a rebuilt home, a shanty as it was called. I'm just going back one, yeah, okay. Interesting fact is that Paul Halliday was a Civil War veteran. Uh, he was injured twice in duty for his country. He was one of the first volunteers to the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln named them the Orange Blossoms. And that's why I had a picture of the, there's a statue there in Goshen dedicated to the Orange Blossoms. And I believe that uh, Orange County was the reason that they were given that name. Okay. This is an actual crime scene photo. So I can't see very well without my glasses I'm leaning in here. Uh, this is the bedroom with disheveled bed covers. Um, this is also in the book. This is the uh, barn. That's actually the, the Halliday barn. None of this exists anymore. Okay. When Lizzie arrives in Burlingham, her demeanor changes drastically. Starts acting insane. Constable Scott, who escorted her to Bloomingburg, confirms she was acting sane to and from Bloomingburg on their trip. The bodies in the barn turn out to be two women that no one recognizes. This is uh, more or less a description. Uh, now that's exactly where the women were found. There's another crime scene photo of the compost area where uh, they would drop hay manure down under the barn. Lizzie is moved uh, to Justice Thayer's house where she's held under suspicion of murder. She's questioned about the whereabouts of her husband and the identity of these two women, who no one seems to recognize. 
<clears throat> As Lizzie is being held in nearby Wurtsboro, uh, a group identified in through history as gypsies are overheard planning a breakout attempt for Lizzie. Law enforcement plans to move Lizzie to a proper jail as evidence continues to be gathered, which implies her direct involvement of the murder of the two women. When suddenly, Paul Sr. is found. He had been buried underneath the kitchen floorboards all along. Just gonna read a little bit more here. On the afternoon of September 7th, Lizzie was in Justice Thayer's court being prepared to be handed over to the authorities in Monticello when Deputy Canfield burst in and interrupted the courtroom. The news Canfield brought to the court brought the proceedings to a screeching halt. Paul Halliday's body had been found. It was hidden under the floorboards of the kitchen. Thayer ordered Lizzie into the custody of armed guards again. Coroner Roche was summoned and the group headed to Halliday Farm. Relatives and neighbors had grown frustrated by not finding Paul Halliday, either living or dead, and had decided to meet at his farm on the morning of September 7th to do something about it. Gathered at the scene were neighbors William Grieve and James W. Henry, as well as Paul Sr.'s relatives, Paul Jr. and Cornelius Canfield, who I mentioned, turned out to be uh, Paul Sr.'s son-in-law. There was a general search of the house again when the discussion turned to the extraordinary amount of dirt inside the house, as well as the presence of two shovels. The men also noted how Paul Sr.'s best clothes were on a hook on the back of a door. Why wouldn't he have taken these clothes if he left the house? Pinned to these clothes was his Grand Army of the Republic badge, which he proudly wore wherever he went. Some of the men began to look at the floorboards and toss aside some rugs. William Grieve noticed in the kitchen that some of the grain on the floorboards didn't match properly. It looked like some of the boards had been removed and placed back after first being rotated from their original placement. They grabbed the crowbar left in the house and pried loose the questionable boards. Underneath, the soil looked loose as if it had been freshly turned over. They pushed the crowbar straight down into the dirt and it traveled easily to a depth of 18 inches before it stopped. It hit an object, but that object felt soft and gave way to the pressure of the crowbar. It was clearly not a rock, of this they were certain. The suspicions of the gathered men were aroused as to the possibility of a body being buried there. The men began to slowly remove the loose soil to see if they can confirm their suspicion. There's something, said Canfield. Eventually hands were visible, tied at the wrist and crossed over the chest. Then a burlap cloth was noticed which seemed to be covering the head and face. The men looked at each other gravely before proceeding. Slowly, enough dirt was removed to peel back the cloth and a collective grasp was emitted by the group. <clears throat> the men looked at each other gravely before proceeding. Uh, okay, it's him, one of the men said. It's Halliday. Paul Jr. had stopped looking down into the dark hole once the hands had been uncovered. Paul Jr. stood and was slowly backing away from the hole. His worst fears were coming true on this horrible morning. One of the men stood and took Paul Jr. by the arm, offering him comfort and stability if he needed it. He was gently guided to the edge of the hole to identify the body. Paul Jr. looked into the dark pit in the floor and quickly covered his eyes with his hands. Well, asked the neighbor, James Henry. Paul Jr. choked out a reply with great difficulty. It's him. It was decided the men needed to get the authorities to the holiday farm as soon as possible and nothing else should be touched. The overwhelming smell of death and decay had begun to fill the small shanty and the doors and windows were thrown open. 
a good cross breeze that day did quickly help refresh the indoor air, but it was clear that Paul Halliday Sr. had been deceased for some time. Cornelius Canfield was sent to Justice Thayer's to alert the authorities to their findings, while the remaining men stood around the open spot in the floorboards, solemnly bound their heads, bowed their heads and said a quiet prayer. <clears throat> see where we are on slides. This is the actual crime scene photo of the kitchen. And that's an artist's rendition of them uh, removing Paul from that spot in the floor. It is arranged for Lizzie to travel to Monticello to be jailed in the Monticello jails awaiting trial. While in the Monticello jail, Lizzie gets a visit from a, a reporter, Nellie Bly. Anyone know Nellie Bly? Nellie Bly. No, no, you're thinking Lizzie Borden. Uh, now, Nellie Bly was a reporter, a female reporter, way ahead of her time. She was the equivalent of what Geraldo Rivera was in his heyday, someone who liked to shake things up. Uh, she was very much um, known for defending the rights of incarcerated women who were mistreated, um, mentally ill women. She fought against the death penalty, uh, among other things. Let me see where we are on that page. <clears throat> Nellie Bly was an alias, um, which she took from an old famous vaudeville song. Uh, her real name was Elizabeth Cochran. So Nellie Bly, wants to know as much about Lizzie Halliday as possible. So she sends reporters uh, from her paper, which was, uh, it was, it was either Globe or the World, I'm sorry. It's, it's in the book though. Um, so Nellie Bly sent reporters far and wide to dig up as much about Lizzie Halliday's past as possible finding this very difficult um, publication uh, where Nellie Bly published this in two Sundays editions of the New York City newspaper, it gave a lot of information about Lizzie and her background. We learned from this investigation, among other things, that Paul Halliday is her sixth husband. And at this time, Lizzie is about 23. We also find that in 1888, Lizzie was convicted of arson and served time in Eastern State Penitentiary. I was going to read a little bit more about that. Um, and this was a very difficult uh, portion of Lizzie's life to find in the newspapers in, in, as a researcher, as myself, because Lizzie went by aliases while in the Philadelphia area. In January of 1888, Lizzie found a small home for rent at 2840 Kensington Avenue, Philadelphia. The property was owned by the Fitzpatrick pam, family who lived next door and ran a small peddler shop at street level. The other side of the new rental was a home owned by a family with the last name of Mason. Lizzie paid $30 for two months rent in advance and told the owner that soon her mother would be coming to live with her as well as her young son. Her, her young son was with her then. Lacking any belongings, Lizzie furnished the lodgings with items purchased on an installment plan from McGran, a furniture dealer on Huntington Street. 
She then proceeded to Queen Insurance Company and took out an insurance policy on her newly purchased furniture. What came to light later was the odd fact that Lizzie's furniture cost her $37.50 and was insured for $600. Lizzie's plan was to run a small business or shop in the downstairs street level of the Kensington Avenue house and live upstairs with her son. Lizzie started out small with her business by acquiring barrels of cabbage and potatoes and selling those out of her shop on the curbside for a markup. She quickly added loaves of bread for sale as well. Her business was not doing too well. So is Lizzie added a lunch menu, which consisted of a soup and a roll for 10 cents. She had a couple of tables in the downstairs shops for customers to sit and eat, but sold most of the items out of an open window at the curb. One of her regular customers was a kindly older gentleman whose name has been lost to history but provides an important eyewitness account later of Lizzie's peculiar behavior. His anonymous testimony given later in a newspaper article to follow is the only eyewitness testimony to the events that were about to transpire. Um, here's a quote from the world uh, and that, that was Nellie Bly's paper. <coughs> Uh, now I'll skip that quote. Regardless, when Lizzie was in Philadelphia, 1888, there was a massive blizzard. Anybody hear about this blizzard? Huge storm. In March of 1888, from the 11th to the 14th, a historic blizzard ravaged the east coast of the United States. It was a crippling storm with howling winds, huge snowfall totals, and bone-chilling cold temperatures. Cities all along the eastern seaboard in the United States were paralyzed, buried under as much as 55 inches of snow. Over 400 deaths were attributed to this storm. So that was the 11th to the 14th. On the morning of the 14th, 1888, the Philadelphia Fire Department is called to an alarm at 2840 Kensington Avenue. What they found when they arrived was an out of control of fire in an upstairs room that was quickly spreading to the houses on either side. Fortunately, both the Fitzpatrick and Mason families escaped the homes with no injuries. <clears throat> what they found when they arrived, uh, no, I said that, sorry. All three homes burned to the ground along with everything inside. As the firemen entered Lizzie's house, they noticed there were no furnishings except several pots and kettles set in the middle rooms containing burning rag, rags doused in coal oil. The fire looked suspiciously like arson and their prime suspect was nowhere to be found. Lizzie and her young son were missing and the authorities were very anxious to speak with her. City Detective Frank Geyer and Fire Marshal Thompson were assigned to the case to define exactly what caused the fire and for the detective to locate the whereabouts of the missing tenant. Detective Geyer soon teamed up <clears throat> with Detective Downey and found a trail that would lead directly to Lizzie. Later, when questioning about how the fire started, Lizzie blamed unknown assailants for the crime. She dared not speak of who did this heinous deed explaining her life would be in jeopardy. And this is a quote uh, from Lizzie, uh, later given to Nellie Bly. Oil was poured out of a lamp over the floor and a match set to it. I saw it all, but I didn't do it. I didn't speak because I was afraid and I would be killed, but I lay in bed with my eyes open watching the whole thing done. Then I was arrested convicted and sent to the penitentiary. After Lizzie had her first hearing, an older gentleman was found looking at the smoldering homes and asked if he knew the occupants. Explain, he explained that he was a stationary salesman and had become acquainted with the young widow who lived there. He visited on the night of the great blizzard and as he left his valise in her possession, while traveling that day, uh, the young widow uh, appealed for him to stay the night and not venture out into the storm. 
He explained that he almost did stay, but was overcome by a fearful feeling and decided to return to his own rented room on Frankfurt Road. He congratulated himself on this narrow escape and was not seen again on Kensington Avenue. There's a great deal about how the detectives uh, caught up with uh, Lizzie and uh, tracked her down. <clears throat> So that was 1888, the blizzard and the fire. Lizzie was con uh, convicted and sent to Eastern State for two years. She acted up, meaning in a mentally insane manner, towards the end of her sentencing and was sent to a home to complete her sentence. Um, she escaped. In 1890, an unsolved murder at the lead mines in Wurtsboro may be attributed to Lizzie Halliday. <clears throat> so Lizzie escapes Philadelphia. Uh, when she gets in what is basically a halfway house, she splits heads up in this area. In May of 1890, a peddler known as Hutch was peddling his goods in Wurtsboro, which is at the base of the um, Shawangump Mountains in New York. While in town, he told some locals his travel route for the next few days. He had just come from Newburgh through the Walker Valley region, ended in Wurtsboro, and now intended to travel via railroad track that headed straight to Ellenville. After Ellenville, he would head due north to Kingston. That evening, he would camp somewhere in the region of Summitville for the night. Hutch often camped out in the open while traveling between towns if the weather permitted. When the weather was poor, he rented lodgings for the night, sometimes simply paying a farmer to sleep in his barn. Whether someone overheard Hutch's travel plans or they just came upon him while he is camped is unknown. What is known is that he was robbed and murdered. An attempt was made to conceal the crime by dropping his body into the old lead mines outside of Wurtsboro and burning his belongings and the encampment. The last people to see Hutch alive were railroad workers working on the now defunct O and W Railroad between Wurtsboro and Summitville. They reported seeing Hutch walking towards Ellenville along the tracks and noting it was late in the day. They presumed he'd not make it there until the following day and would have camped nearby for the night. During the night, residents living near the vicinity of the crime reported seeing the night sky light up brightly from a tremendous bonfire. The fire, they reported, seemed to be in the wooded area near the old lead mines. Not much was thought of it until the body was found days later. <clears throat> As a further uh, investigation from Nellie Bly, research shed light upon uh, 1891 series of fires at the Halliday home. Okay, by 1891, I, I detail it greatly in the book, she's already met Paul Halliday, uh, become his house servant, then marries him at Paul's assistant, uh, insistence, and um, shortly afterwards, his home burns down. With his developmentally uh, disabled son inside, Johnny, who Lizzie couldn't stand. The most startling fact that was brought out by Nellie Bly was that Lizzie, having admitted to her husband to setting that fire, that claimed the life of John Holliday, and that Paul had not reported this crime to Sullivan County authorities. Not until months later, when Lizzie was arrested in Newburgh, New York, did Paul attempt to have Lizzie charged with arson and murder. It was pointed out to Paul that the crimes had actually been committed in another jurisdiction 
and he needed to report the crime there. <clears throat> this is another period or time you know, where I begin to think about motive and uh, motive, what would be the motive for Paul Holiday uh, continually forgiving this woman? Early in the month of June of 1891, Paul and Lizzie set out to Newburgh, New York. Paul intended to spend a great deal of money to buy a team of horses for his farm. Unfortunately, the horses had died in a fire in the barn, a fire that Lizzie had set. They took the journey and got to uh, Mrs. Smith's, which is an employer and lodger in Newburgh, New York, late on Friday to rent a room for the night and shop for the horses the following day. It was at this time that Mrs. Smith learned of the tragedy and ill fortune that had fallen upon the Holiday family farm. Paul relayed the tragic series of fires to Mrs. Smith as follows. Now, this is in an, a newspaper article. This Mrs. Smith is quoted as giving this story. Paul had left the farm early in the morning with two loads of charcoal that would be delivered in Middletown. His son Johnny had been up early with his father in the pre-dawn morning hours, helping his father get the horses and load of charcoal ready for travel. When Paul departed, Johnny headed back to his room with his lantern, where he was in the habit of doing whittling. Lizzie was ill and bedridden that morning when Johnny rushed into her room in great excitement. He announced that the house was on fire and insisted his ailing stepmother out of the house. Once getting Lizzie safely outside, Johnny returned into the burning house to retrieve many of the household goods and furnishings. After several trips in and out of the fire, he was overcome by smoke and never came out of the house again. Johnny died May 4th, 1891 at the age of 37. The coroner report lists the cause of death as accidentally suffocating in a burning building. Although Lizzie stated to Paul, she physically attacked Johnny and cut his throat with a bread knife, Roche neglected to mention any injuries to the body. Perhaps due to the condition of the body, uh, due to the fire and early forensic pathology, these injuries were not found on the corpse. Um, So um, I usually read this off. Oh, no, it's not that. This is what we've, I usually read this off the projector. Uh, this is what Nellie Bly has uncovered. Uh, and this is also one of only three photos that exist of Lizzie Halliday. This is her school age photo around the age of 14, Newburgh, New York. These are the facts that Nellie Bly found out. She was born in Ireland, 1864, youngest member of her family, settled in Newburgh with her entire family. Uh, they moved to Greenwich, New York, moved to Philadelphia. She moved to Philadelphia after her first husband's death. She's arrested for arson and fraud in 1888, spent two years at Eastern State, Previously married five times, involved in the death of a peddler Hutch, burns down Halliday Barn, killing son, steals horses and a wagon in Newburgh, and then involved in the Burlingham, New York murders. This brought all this out. Um, oh, there's my cards. Uh, in Monticello, Lizzie awaits trial as District Attorney David S. Hill attempts to build a case against Lizzie. 
Lizzie would wait approximately nine months for a special session of the state Supreme Court to be held. In June of uh, 1894, Lizzie's jury was chosen and the court case started. Although outlined in the book in great detail, Lizzie was found guilty by the jury and sentenced by Judge Edwards to die in the electric chair. <clears throat> so jury members there did not publish the list of jury members in the book. So Lizzie was the first woman in the world sentenced to die in the electric chair. But wait, there's a flower for Lizzie. Governor Flower of New York. He appoints a commission to evaluate Lizzie's sanity. The trial was, uh, they, they call it a bifurcated trial where you decide guilt or innocence or insane or sane. So there's basically, uh, in Lizzie's case, it was not bifurcated trial. She was either guilty and get the death penalty, not guilty due to insanity. That was basically what they were trying to decide. So by mid-July, Governor Flower had appointed a commission to evaluate Lizzie. Um, no, no, yeah. By mid-July, the examination was complete and the commission deemed her insane. The governor provided Lizzie with a pardon for a death sentence and sentenced her to an alternative, which was life imprisonment in an institution for the criminally insane. As early as 1895, well, that, that was Matawan is where she was shipped, Matawan uh, across the river. I don't know if anyone knows it. Yeah. Right, yeah. It's now directly linked to Fishkill Corrections. Um, so um, if I, let me see. Just... So the reason uh, <clears throat> Governor Flower felt that it would be uh, safer to send her to an institution. As early as 1895, Lizzie and another resident, Jane Shannon, attacked a nurse, Kate Ward. Although Lizzie was attempting to strangle Miss Ward, the asylum labeled this an escape attempt, and the two inmates were separated and did never be housed together again. During the following years at Matamon, there were several documented attempts at suicide Lizzie attacking other inmates and escape attempts. <clears throat> in 1901, Lizzie applies for um, and receives, well, there's uh, Matawan, her late husband's military pension. Uh, this alarmed a lot of people who tried to research it and stop Lizzie from receiving her husband's pension, which was $12 a month. He was paid quarterly. There was no law against it, so Lizzie received his pension. There was a law that stated only uh, widows of veterans who killed themselves, those widows, widows could not collect the pension. If you killed your husband, you could still get the pension. So they changed the law. In the meantime, she was getting $36 for what? I don't know. Uh, I, do, I did have a, a complete letter that Lizzie wrote um, seeking these pension funds. Is it there? Yeah. My friend, Mr. Wolf, your honor, 
please apply for my husband's pension for me, whom you know as he gave you his business to do. I therefore pre-fear you to anyone else as you understand the case and you are a capital good hand to hurry up business. Please do not delay about this of mine. I know you will accomplish all you undertake to help me. I need money to help me along as my health is poor and I am sick most of the time. You know, he drawn $36 every three months. And now it's pretty well along in eight years since there was any receipt. Please write me soon and tell me what you will do for me. I, that wasn't clarified, but. <clears throat> the most tragic consequence of Lizzie's pardon in the 19, is the 1906 death of a young, ambitious Matawan attendant and corrections officer, Nellie Wicks. Nellie Wicks had grown close to Lizzie, much too close. And what she didn't know was that by doing so, she was in grave danger. After announcing to Lizzie her plan to leave Matawan and further her nursing career, Lizzie stopped Nellie Wicks in the only way she knew how. She killed her in an ambush attack and stabbed Nellie with a pair of scissors over 200 times in the face and neck. We are reminded here of the words of Governor Flower when pardoning Lizzie. I do not think her a fit subject for the death penalty. It would be much safer to commute the sentence to life in prison. Mint. I guess not safer for Nellie Wicks. But once again, Lizzie commits another first. Nellie Wicks was the first female corrections officer ever killed in the line of duty. <clears throat> Lizzie continued her reign of terror at Manawan and due to this horrific behavior with Nellie Wicks, she was actually placed in solitary confinement, never allowed out to exercise, socialize with staff and residents, remaining uh, alone for four years. In 1911, the Matawan facility had undergone an overhaul of staff, partially due to Lizzie's solitary confinement uh, and lapses of security, an internal investigation led to drastic changes in the way the facility was to be run. This included residents like Lizzie who had been locked away in solitary confinement and virtually forgotten. And uh, <clears throat> In September of 1911, Lizzie walked outside, visibly shaken with tears running down her cheeks. She was squinting and holding her hand up to shield her eyes from, a, from the overwhelmingly bright ball of fire in the sky. Lizzie had not seen the sun in five years. I said four years. Old. Dr. May was responsible for allowing Lizzie some exercise as he was the new superintendent of the asylum. Dr. Lamb had been investigated due to possibly treating some patients too harshly and was eventually encouraged to step down from his post. Uh, in early 1911, a plot was exposed at Matawan. An inmate, referred to as the Sicilian, had managed to have in his possession a loaded revolver and a number of live ammunition for the gun. Additionally, he had in his possession several homemade knives. The intent was that he and other inmates would cause a revolt at the institution and execute Sup Superintendent Lamb, as well as the first assistant physician. This disclosure brought 
a full investigation by then Governor Dix, who placed the onus of responsibility on Superintendent Lamb. Although this did not have any direct connection to Lizzie or her involvement in any way, it eventually brought scrutiny to Madawan that gave some leniency on her solitary confinement in order to preserve her overall physical health. The physical toll of confinement was obvious on Lizzie. She looked frail and weak. She initially needed assistance walking and had lost a tremendous amount of weight. Dr. May was quoted as saying that if a cure was ever possible, it would never be reached under such conditions as they had been enforced. It seemed that Dr. Lamb, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I won't read that. Sorry about this small screen here. Uh, this is Paul Halliday's um, tombstone, at the Walker Valley Cemetery in uh, right, side of, right outside of Birmingham. And um, there's where Lizzie's buried. She's basically in an unmarked grave on the Matawan property, uh, which is only given a number. Paul, on the other hand, is buried in the shady Walkerberry Cemetery next to his first wife, Ellen, and his son, Paul Jr. In June of 1918, it was announced that Lizzie Halliday, the worst woman in the world, as, as deemed by the New York Times, had died. Lizzie suffered from chronic Bright's disease or acute kidney failure. Um, as I mentioned, there's a great more detail about all these incidences in the book. Uh, we will be selling copies here, which I'd be glad to autograph. But I want to thank you all for coming. And um, any questions?